Well, I, I have to say, previous presentation, there's something about topics that if you ask five people, you'd get seven different opinions. It just lends themselves nicely to this sort of thing. Um, our, our next topic uh, is very similar. Um, it's one of those things where if you ask enough people, you will get a bunch of different answers, and so it's definitely worth one of the worth pursuing a little further. So here to discuss uh, class length and frequency uh, with music on the elementary school level is Michelle Nunnally and Chris Milner. Hey, uh, hi everybody, so I'm Chris, this is Michelle. Um, I teach music, I teach um, at Birch Hill Elementary School. I teach general music in grades uh, K through five. Uh, so general music would be um, teaching um, the basics of music and singing, uh, through singing, movement, and uh, instrument performance. Um, I also teach chorus, uh, fourth and fifth grade chorus. I have a slot choir there, and I also co-teach uh, fourth and fifth grade band. Um, I've been at Birch Hill and in the National School District for, this is my fourth year. All right, and my name is Michelle Nunnally. This is my third year teaching, although this is my first year in the Nashua School District. And I'm very grateful because I've been having a wonderful year at Broad Street. I do pre-K through five music, as well as fourth and fifth grade chorus hopefully banned sometime soon. And I also go over to Fairgrounds Elementary on Mondays, and I teach seven classes, which is about 140 kids in one day. <laughs> it is a big day. <laughs> so, some music puns for you. You're all looking sharp today. <laughs> we hope our presentation doesn't fall flat. <laughs> music is our forte, after all. Okay, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed those. Uh, so, length and frequency. So, uh, the reason we got started with this is um, kindergarten, uh, at least within the last um, few years, at, in um, the unified arts here at the elementary level in Nashville, has been um, we don't teach it, uh, we haven't taught it up until last year because we didn't have full day kindergarten. So, last year we started uh, including kindergartners in the unified arts, which is fantastic. Uh, most schools, some did 50 minutes last year, but most schools were teaching uh, 30 minutes a week, uh, so one class to uh, the kindergartners. This included music. Um, this year, almost every school, uh, every school is 50 minutes a week, um, and this is mostly 50 minutes a week, one class a week. Some it's 25 minutes twice a week, usually split between two different UAs. Um, so we wanted to see what, you know, was this scheduling decision, is it benefiting the students? Was it made with the students' development and interest in mind? Uh, were administrators having the freedom to choose the schedule they think best suits their students? And was there a difference between the classes uh, that were taught in 20 minute intervals and those that saw kindergartners in one 50 minute setting? Luckily, the two teachers that get to split classes are Michelle and I. I split first grade, 25 minutes with PE and 25 minutes with music twice a week. Michelle uh, will kind of, uh, you split yeah, 25 I minutes. Yeah, I split kindergarten, yeah. not first grade, so I have them 25 minutes once a week at fairgrounds. Um, I don't split up Broad Street, but that means later on in the week, the fairgrounds music teacher has them for the other 25 minutes. So between two different So teachers. it makes things a little bit more complicated in that sense. But we're going to begin with our literature review, which is a little bit lengthy because we were looking at quite a lot of research and quite a lot of existent policies. So we started with federal policies, national recommendations, um, New Hampshire state laws, and then we were looking also at national school district policies surrounding music um, within arts education law. And um, we were trying to synthesize all of this information to see if you know one scheduling practice is better than the other. Um, so our action research, these were our two big questions. Are there quantitative differences in retention of concepts and growth in musical skills? Once a week, 50 minutes versus twice a week, 25. And are there qualitative differences, so observations that we identify over the course of our study? So these are our action research goals. Notice I underlined the verbs. Um, we want to inform discussions surrounding our schedules. Uh, we want to empower our administrators as well as other music teachers um, with more specific information so that they feel comfortable having these discussions in a very productive way. 
Um, and also to just ensure that, um, as always, the best student-centered decisions are being made. Right, and I was just going to say, this is what Chris was talking about earlier. Yep, so this is our first chart of the day. So uh, this chart, uh, we surveyed all the music teachers in the district. Uh, we had kind of a general idea of the schedules that each music teacher had, but um, at the elementary level, we surveyed all the elementary school teachers at all um, of the elementary schools to see what the frequency and length of classes were. And as you can see, um, 50, every class, uh, every kindergarten class does see music for 50 minutes a week. Two classes, uh, two schools split. Um, of course, uh, Amherst Street and Birch Hill, the schools that Michelle and I teach at, which we were talking about earlier. And uh, most schools, the frequency is once a week for 50 minutes. Uh, so Michelle uh, splits, kindergarten is split at fairgrounds, 25 minutes, um, two times per week, and they split with PE. Uh, that's taught by, Jen, uh, by Jenna Depre and Michelle Lennon, so two different teachers. At Birch Hill, um, I split first grade, 25 minutes twice per week, and I split with Dave Verano, who is the PE teacher at Birch Hill. All right, so this is a little bit about our arts education timeline. I kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit with this. So I tried to summarize the best of my ability. <laughs> the first time um, federally arts education is included is in Goal 2000, uh, which is a law that is passed in 1994 by U.S. Congress. And um, these are the first nine music standards, uh, national music standards, that are voluntary. Um, Interestingly, out of all of the policy research, this is the national recommendation that stands. It says, every student receives general music instruction each week for at least 90 minutes, excluding time devoted to elective instrumental or choral instruction. So I thought that was very interesting. And that comes from that 1994 uh, development of the policy, which those were voluntary. So we continue to look at arts education policy. Um, so in 2011, New Hampshire um, adopts the 1994 National Music Standards in the form of the New Hampshire uh, K through 12 Curriculum Framework for the Arts. We currently, this is the standard that we have Michelle uh, Vanna White's over there for you. Um, that is currently still what we use in New Hampshire and it is still based on the, 2000 and, uh, the 1994 standards. Um, in 2008, uh, Arts education becomes a part of an adequate uh, education at the federal level. And in 2014, NAFME, again, the National Association for Music Education, um, comes up with new music standards based on artistic process, so creating, performing, and responding. So again, the New Hampshire Framework for the Arts is not based on those standards. It's based on the NAFME standards from 2001. Um, Nashua, uh, in 2014, we created a new uh, curriculum for music. Um, and we implement that curriculum still uh, in the district to this day. And in 2015, Congress passes the Every uh, Student Succeeds Act. So this affects music in a few different ways. Um, some of the ways that it affects it is schools can now access, assess their ability to provide a well-rounded education. This includes music and address any deficiencies uh, using federal funds. All Title I programs can provide supplemental funds uh, for a well-rounded education, including music. And um, it also allows uh, funds from Titles 1, 2, and 4 of ESSA may also support professional development for music educators. Um, the new SSA discourages removing students from the classroom, including music and the arts, for remedial instruction. So they need to be in the music classroom when it's their time to be there, um, which is a really great thing to have in place. It also, uh, states must now include multiple progress measures for assessing school performance, which can include um, music-friendly measures such as student engagement, parent engagement, and school and culture climates. And in March 2019, New Hampshire is in the process of reviewing and uh, kind of retooling and restructuring the New Hampshire framework for the arts. Um, they're doing listening sections and uh, kind of consulting with music educators at this time to rework those frameworks. Okay, and we're all done with policy now. <laughs> if you have any specific questions, I do have supplemental materials up here. Um, the important New Hampshire policies are at 306, section 31, that's all of New Hampshire's arts education requirements, and then also chapter 15, 193E and 193C.
Okay, so the first thing we looked at when kind of looking into the differences between class length and frequency and how it affects student retention of information was we looked at developmental research. Uh, so a few years ago, I was, I never got around to reading it, uh, so this is a perfect opportunity to read it, but I was mentioned, I was recommended by my wife, uh, who's a school counselor, uh, to read a book called um, Yardsticks by Chip Wood. Uh, the book um, looks at the different abilities and things that students can do, so um, at the different developmental levels. This included uh, class length and, and um, those topics as well. So um, would, it looks at uh, ages 4 through 12 in the book, and he states in the book that children's developmental needs should be the foundation of every decision, uh, every choice that we make for our classrooms and for our schools. Special subjects such as art, music, and physical education, he does say, are often kept to a half an hour periods. But he also says that students would benefit from longer periods as well. So it's sort of this kind of gray area that, yes, he does say that most classes are 30 minutes in those areas, but it might benefit from having longer classes as well. Mm -hmm. Now, moving on from our literature review research into our action research that we carried out this past year. So quantitative data was what we collected over a series of weeks. Um, concepts assessed, skill assessed, and we will be talking about our research method, analysis, and conclusions. So that will be our outline for the remainder of our presentation. So these are some of the concepts that we assessed during the course of the study. So during rhythm, um, with kindergarten and first grade, music is made of meaningful sound and silence, long or short, and specific rhythms and notation. So pitch. Um for non-musicians, pitch is how high or low a sound is. So the concept of identifying visually, um, for the most part, small instruments are higher pitched, larger instruments are lower pitched. Um, sounds can be both high or low. Uh, we looked at the four instrument families of the orchestra, string, woodwinds, brass, <coughs> percussion, and visually identifying those instruments. Uh, we talked about major versus minor, so um, Michelle and I both use solfege, so for those of you that are familiar with the sound of music, do, a deer, a female deer. Those words are solfege. Um, so students are recognizing pitch uh, with the different solfege syllables. Mm -hmm. And these are the musical skills we assessed for growth over that period. Uh, rhythm, identify and move to long versus short sounds. Reading and performing rhythms with syllables such as ta, ti, ti, you know, all of that. <laughs> um, as well as composing their own rhythms, rehearsing and performing them accurately. So for pitch, uh, the skills that were assessed were identifying instruments uh, with pitch and without pitch. So instruments such as non-pitch percussion, wood block, triangle, drum, things like that. Uh, identifying and moving to high and low sounds, um, using body movement, but also uh, manipulatives, things like scarves, uh, bean bags, things like that to um, show the different um, pitches with movement. Match pitch while singing. And as we said before, use singing sol la mi and do re mi songs. Um, so these are not necessarily using the solfege, but those are the pitches that students should be able to identify at that time. And also identifying instruments by sound. Mm -hmm. All right, so for our research methods, what we decided to do was to do an assessment at the start of every class. So we called this our recall assessment. Um, and these took many forms. It could be verbal questions, um, listening to a piece of music, responding to it performing, performing melodies or rhythms, um, moving expressively. Like I oftentimes have my kids um, do expressive movement and acting and facial expressions, dance in addition to singing and instruments. Um, and we decided to record the percentage of students who responded accurately. I decided to define accurately because in music, yes, sometimes there is an absolute correct answer. And in other times, there's a range of correct answers because as we know, music can be objective and it can be emotional and people can hear something and respond in different ways to it. Um, so start of class recall assessments, just recalling things from last week and any qualitative observations that came up during the course of it. Okay, so our data analysis, our guiding questions when analyzing the data was, was there a quantifiable difference in students' retention of concepts? Was there a quantifiable difference in the growth of the students' musical skills? 
were there qualitative factors that interfered with this research? And then we did the percentage of students, the average uh, in each class who responded accurately to uh, the question. Okay, so my data collection with my kindergarten and first grade students took place over the course of five weeks. And as you can see up here, so these are the percentages of um, students who responded accurately to those questions at the beginning of class. So pretty high for the most part. Not really significant differences, although I do have a couple of boxes marked not applicable. And that is because of some unforeseen things that came up with my Monday classes this year. So I saw them on Monday, February 11th. Then there was President's Day. Then there was February vacation. Mm -hmm. And then we had a snow day after February vacation. So then the next time I saw them was Monday, March 11th. So there was a big gap in my data for my fairgrounds kindergarten A and my fairgrounds kindergarten B, as well as for my fairgrounds first grade because of that. So that's why that's there. So I um, did mine over the course of three weeks, just given kind of some similar things that Michelle was talking about, where this was where I could see the kids and everybody had me for three weeks in a row, given uh, field trips, holidays, different schedules. Um, and I uh, did the uh, research in those three weeks with my students, um, again, with kindergarten and first grade, using the same um, approaches that Michelle used. All right, so our conclusions, as you could kind of see in my percentages, there weren't really significant differences between the students who had music twice a week or once a week for a longer amount of time. Um, so I think it just comes down to teacher preference, administrative preference, whatever works for your school, your teachers, your kids. Um, I will say having it twice a week, if um, you are able to see them both times as their teacher, that is a good thing in case schedule things like this come up. That way they don't miss music for a month. That's really hard for kindergartners and first graders to deal with. <laughs> Um, and I know I myself, I actually really like the 50 minutes once a week. And that's just my personal preference. So um, again, with my data, no significant difference in retention between the two class formats. I think what this uh, project did was it made me look at not just how the students were affected by this the different schedule, but how I was affected. For different re there are different reasons why I think um, 50 minutes can work and why 25 minutes can work. I have certain kindergarten classes where 50 minutes is a long time no matter how fast paced you keep it. I have them doing, I mean, we don't do one activity for more than 10 minutes. I mean, it's, it's very fast paced, which works for them, but there are times where by the end they are just ready to move on to the next place. They're in one room for 50 minutes, it's a lot. Um, but, you know, it's also 25 minutes is not a lot of time. Uh, I do like seeing them back to back, so I have one group where I see the kids on Thursday, the first graders for 25 minutes, and then I see them again on Friday. But on my Monday and Wednesday classes, there's a day, a gap in between. So there's a lot of, I think that right now, where there's not a specific policy that dictates what the schedule should be for Unified Arts, it allows some sort of freedom with the teacher administrators to do what works best for them in terms of the schedule. And I think Michelle and I can both agree that right now, that's probably what's best. That is absolutely what's best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Flexibility is always good. Um, and then another thing about switching with Jim, my kindergartners, we swapped with Jim, and I always found my first group of kindergartners at Fairgrounds, we were ready to learn, ready to move, and then when I got my second group after gym class, um, they were tired, they were asking, oh, could I get water, and it led to quite a few interruptions. I can <laughs> concur with that. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, de it depends. Um, you know, one thing that is also interesting that I found is that it depends on what they're doing in PE. And I'm sure it works the same way because there are times where my music classroom was like a gym class. We're moving, we're doing movement, they're up and down, they're working with partners. Um, it, it depends on what either of us are doing that day. But that is a factor for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So these are just some other things that came up during our research. Um, we, were, we found it very interesting that Nashua had very little existent policy surrounding music um, and other specialists. It is listed in the student and parent handbooks um, under the program of studies. 
um, elementary, page 45, if you're curious. <laughs> Although it doesn't really go into, you know, how much time per week and things of that nature. So it has flexibility, which is good, but it's also a little concerning. So just something to think about. Um, and then, as Chris mentioned earlier, our New Hampshire state music standards are still 1994. Um, Although Nashua, we're very progressive and up to date, we are using the more robust 2014 standards, which are more comprehensive. So, um, although our three grading standards in teacher ease um, at the moment aren't really reflective of that. So, yeah, maybe something for a future project. All right, and that's it. Oh. <laughs>